At the same time, it's very creative what's going on here. Because basically what's happening is this is dating simulator games, simulation games, that are birthing a character. That character is called a maid. And this character is performed in consumer space. So people come here and they buy a drink that costs a thousand yen because the maid is there. So it's an entirely new, in, very interesting kind of effective labor that works really well. Um, this particular maid cafe, at home uh, cafe, uh, I think between 2004 and 2006 had about a 649% increase in media appearances. So it's a huge jump uh, for these maid cafes, and they're really kind of positioned as a new kind of uh, Akiba only, otaku only creativity. Uh, I'll give you an example. In 2003, the first maid cafe was shown on television. And this was um, against the will of most of the owners and the people who were in the maid cafes, because they wanted kind of this private otaku sanctuary, much like Akihabara itself is a private otaku sanctuary. Um, where would it appear in 2003? Who was able to break down the barriers and show maid cafes to the general populace on TV? Take a guess. Who would it be? Foreigners? Good guess. Good guess. Um, now it's mostly foreigners who are doing media coverage in the maid cafes, but in the beginning it wasn't. It was actually Nikkei. Nikkei. So the Japanese kind of economic newspaper has a uh, television show. It's called Gaia no Yoake. And Gaia no Yoake did a special on maid cafes, and they said, ah, look what these guys are doing. This is kind of interesting, isn't it? And they showed this on a very conservative television show talking about Japanese economics. So after that, there was this huge increase in um, maid cafes, and also there's an increase in services. Maids used to be kind of just um, people who were walking around wearing costumes. They had no name tags, they had no services, nothing going on. There was only four maid cafes in all of Akihabara in 2004. So it was a very subdued kind of thing. In 2004, when the first boom started to happen in Akihabara, two notable things happened. This was, of course, the first year I was in Akihabara. One thing I noticed is they started wearing name tags. People started coming to Akihabara to see specific maids. So it's kind of like a low-level geisha thing going on here. And the second thing was they started playing games. Right? So at, at first, I was in the maid cafe just taking notes, doing my ethnography thing. And then suddenly, they started coming over and saying, let's play a game. They'd slap down a, a board game and they'd say, five hundred yen. And we played games together. So it started, it started to become more intuitive. It started to become kind of more performative and more interactive in the maid cafes. And the reason why we find out is because this sells better to the media. Short skirts that are colorful sell better than long Victorian frocks. Go figure. Girls who are kind of dancing and singing sell better than girls who are bowing and being coquettish. And so basically this image of maids uh, developed uh, in interaction with the camera crews coming to Akihabara. And it grew from, 49, uh, from four to 49 locations between uh, 2004 and 2006 around Densho Toko. So right now we have like a, a saturation of maid cafes in Akihabara. If you go down there, you'll find a maid cafe on every corner. You'll find maids passing out flyers all over the place. And usually we say, ah, those are taco. They're in there, they just love those beautiful girls. And actually, the truth is, most otaku don't go to maid cafes anymore because they feel like it's no longer an otaku space. One guy told me that it's a cultural deviance within otaku culture. Otaku culture itself is a vector towards deviance, right? But he said, inside of that vector towards deviance, this is way too deviant. Because it's so deviant, it went back to the mainstream. And that doesn't work for me. So um, starting in about 2006, six seven, people stopped going to maid cafes. That was the drop in the regulars' culture. But um, anyway, you can see how closely tied the image is with the mediation of Akihabara. And one of the reasons why, of course, is because maids are much uh, better looking than dating simulator games, which tend to be very sexual, and doujinshi, which are amateur comic books. These are actually the two largest markets in Akihabara. Dating simulator games for PCs, of course, because PCs are already there. Anime, they love characters. Put them together, voila, dating simulator game. So that's one market. The other market is uh, doujinshi, which is kind of like manga porn. It makes sense in a lot of ways, but the government couldn't uh, use this. The media couldn't use this, so they focused on maids instead. Okay, so what happened because of all these tourists, otaku, everybody converging? People from the countryside coming to Akihabara to be part of the otaku culture. 
people who weren't even into otaku culture coming to Akihabara to check it out, people coming to Akihabara to become famous, that kind of thing. <coughs> this is what, in, what it ended up like. Um, you can't actually see it, but this is one side of the street, and we're standing on the other side of the street. It's a wall of people all the way across. Cars couldn't get through, people couldn't walk, you couldn't do anything. And what are they actually doing? They're taking pictures of this idol, a girl in a maid costume wearing uh, cat ears. So they're all around here taking pictures. Back here is another one, and over here is another one. He's actually doing a, uh, a video all the way over here. So you can see very clearly that there was a huge kind of um, performative thing going on here. This is tied, of course, to um, the shutting down of Harajuku. Because in the 1990s, Harajuku used to have a huge street culture. It's called Den Den Street, or um, Den Street. So a huge street culture. And basically, the government said in the 1990s, during the recession, you guys are weird, and we don't like you, but we can't do anything about it. But the Iranians, these Iranians who were in Yogi Park, they're selling drugs. I know it. I can feel it in my bones. So they deported the Iranians, and at the same time, they closed down the street culture. So now, actually, there's very few people on the street in Harajuku. These street performers went to other places where they could perform, which was, at the end of the 1990s, Akihabara. So a lot of people from Harajuku came down there. And so you had basically performers who had nothing to do with otaku culture, performing otaku culture for otaku, often who themselves weren't otaku. And in the back streets, you had people who were going there to buy anime, manga, girl games, dojenshi, stuff like that. So two levels of otaku going on here, different performances that were conditioned by the media <coughs> and by the economic and social conditions. Okay, so who was the first one to kind of do tours to Akihabara? Because they, they did appear. The first one actually was Pop Travel Japan, which still exists. It's a very, it's a, like a venerable company um, who does all kinds of um, tours to Japan. Actually, they offer so many tours that they've become kind of like niche within the niche within the niche. They offer like a samurai tree tour or something like that. And there's all different kinds of tours that serve any kind of interest. So they're kind of on their way out, some people say. But in the early um, uh, development of overseas otaku tours, they were a big name. And they started doing tours to Tokyo, which included, of course, Akihabara. And the government wasn't going to miss out on this. Oh, no. Oh, no. This was my first um, experience of the government's Akihabara tour. It's 2007, uh, Welcome to Japan Week. I was working for a company called Digital Hollywood University in Akihabara, which is a large, I think it's the first accredited university for animation in Japan. So I was working there, and um, I was basically just a translator. Uh, I was just working part-time, and uh, the producer of Conan, um, Case Closed, was invited to the university to talk. And I learned that he was there to talk to a group of um, 20 foreigners invited from all over the world to do a tour of Japanese pop culture. And that tour was going to take place in Akihabara. I, of course, was not consulted about anything that was happening. I was just supposed to translate. But I went on to the tour, and suffice it to say, I wasn't very impressed with what they showed. But um, that was kind of the impetus to offer my own tour that goes into more cultural uh, and historic detail. What I want to point out to you, though, is so this company, Digital Hollywood University, which is heavily subsidized by the government, Yokosuka Japan, which, of course, is government campaign, all this stuff going on here. Who do you think sponsored this? I'll read it for you. A study on regional development by international tourism based on Japanese manga comics and anime. So it's very clear they're using pop culture as a way to redevelop Akihabara. Akihabara was a testbed for a much larger project called Cool Japan. Look here on the Japan National Tourist Organization website. You can't get much more official than this. An invitation to an otaku tour. Moe. So, I mean, yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to throw it out there. Sometimes people in the Japanese government will deny that they ever used uh, the word otaku in their campaigns. This is a lie, a bold-faced lie. Sometimes in the Japanese texts, they don't use the term. They use enthusiastic fan, etc., etc. But here in the American English version, you see very clearly the word is there. So they're selling otaku to people overseas. At the same time, they're saying, oh, you dirty guys, you dirty guys. 